you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 14. While well, you're turning there, uh, we will remind you, as always, to uh, pray for our missionaries. I haven't heard anything recently from the new building at Mayfield, but I'm hoping they'll have a work day soon and we can go up there and help them uh, get the new building ready. Exodus 14, and we're going to begin reading in verse 9. <coughs> Exodus 14, uh, beginning in verse 9, the Bible says, But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and, and overtook them in camping by the seaside Pahinaroth before Balsavon. <coughs> and when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there are no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in this wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand Amen. still, Amen. and see the salvation of the Lord. And he will shew you today for the and he will shew to you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them no more no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and he shall hold your peace, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward, but lift up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the heart, hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them and I will, I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host and his chariots and upon the horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and upon these chariots and upon these and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went, went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all night. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your book. God, we thank you for what a help it's been to us down through the years. Lord, we pray that you would continue it. Uh, continue to bless it to your people. God, we pray for the lost that meet with us this morning. Even today might be the day that you would manifest yourself to them, that you would save them, and that you would uh, draw them unto yourself. We pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, we'll be preaching this morning on moving forward. Now. Now, what I have found among the Lord's believers in the last years is they don't really move backward, but they don't really move forward either. They're kind of stagnant. They're dry. Uh, they accomplish never, nothing really for the gospel, and they do nothing for the service of the Lord. Now, these scriptures are very familiar, and we're going to look at them in a little bit more detail, but I think sometimes we miss the message of the crossing of the Red Sea because what, what we see is just a simple uh, deliverance of the people when the, the premise of the story is to move forward. 
Uh, there is never, never a stopping place for God's children to lie stagnant. Even if you're a, a member of the same church for 40 years, what you should be doing is sharing the gospel with somebody and say, hey, we're, we're, we're still meeting at 805 Nat Core Drive. If you want to come down and be with us, we'd love to see you there with us. Never a stopping point. But often we do. Often we just give up. And, and no greater victory has the devil than when we say, well, forget about it. This is the last day. Now, I certainly believe that, but this is the truth. You don't know that it's the last day. It may be a hundred more years before the coming of Christ, and in that 100 years, we're to be about the Father's business. We are to be preaching the gospel. We are being, as the Bible says, bidding them to enter to the very last day. Now, you know what happened, and to bring you up to date when we're in our text, the 10 plagues had come against uh, Egypt, the very last one being the death of the firstborn. Everybody that wasn't under the blood uh, of the firstborn died. And now, and, and remember, the nature of man does not change without a move of God. Uh, he will remain even as he is in his sin, is what the Bible says, without the intervention of God. And so we see these horrible plagues that came against Egypt, and he had a, uh, the king, the Pharaoh, had a fleshly repentance, but as soon as the plague was removed, he was back to himself. Uh, that, that's about as far as this fleshly repentance goes. And if you remember the very last one, the death of the firstborn, he finally said, just go. And it didn't last long, and he was ready to run after him. See, that is the nature of man. Ma mankind's nature will not uh, occur without an intervention of God. And, and it has to be that way. And uh, that's the problem today with, with many so-called churches is they're just asking people to do the impossibility. If God doesn't change your heart, you can't trust Jesus. Not only will you not, you can't. That's right. uh, the dead cannot do anything. And so we find that uh, Israel is running and the most powerful army on earth at the time is pursuing after them. You know what's pursuing after you, believer, this morning? It is Satan himself, the most powerful yeah. this army that this yeah. er world knows. Yeah. You ever think about what's going on around us? Mm -hmm. Remember when Elijah prayed uh, uh, for Gehazi and said, Lord, open his eyes. And he said, and he saw all that beautiful host around them. Well, Gehazi got to see the good side. See, there's a bad side to that, too. Demons of every kind all around us all the time. A third of the angels destroyed in their own sin. Cast, the Bible says, into the earth, not to hell. Cast here. And, and, and they're, 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 at, they're at Satan's disposal when he needs to use them. And so we find they're on the run with the enemy right behind them. Verse 10. And when Pharaoh grew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Now, they did what was right. They did the correct thing in the beginning. Now, we'll see that their prayer was very superficial. Their prayer did not amount to much. They cried out to the Lord, and in the next verse, they start mouthing against Moses. That, that is the nature of man. You know, how, how deep is your prayer life? Do you, do, you, do you pray like you believe God's going to do it? Now, you think about the unbelievable circumstances. Four and a half million people moving forward in the cause of God and not even a bow and arrow among the whole bunch. No weapons at all. See, this is one thing about slavery. You can learn a great deal about slavery. Slavery, slaves did not have the benefit of weapons because we know what happens when slaves get weapons, right? They rise up in rebellion. So they had nothing to fight with. 
And, and you know what? That's what the devil, and, and you know, we really don't. Without the Almighty, we have nothing to fight with. But we have the greatest resource on earth when we have faith in it. The Lord God Almighty. Remember, uh, time and time again, if you have the faith, as, as it were, of a, of a mustard seed. Yeah. But we don't. You know who we like to depend on? Self. Right. Yeah. And, and so we find that uh, they're leaving Egypt. <laughs> the Egyptians are right behind them. They make a pitiful little prayer, but notice verse 11. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Now, I want you to see, first of all, the, the ludicrous stupidity of this argument. Now, how, many, how long have they been in Egypt? 400 years, right? I believe a lot of people die in 400 years, don't you? I know of one for sure who said, Take my body out of this place. Joseph, right? He says, uh, when you go back home, take my bones with you. Yeah. And so we know, we know that for sure. So that was stupid. They had literally generations that died down there and were buried as slaves. Now, we'll see in a minute. The real thing is, is that they're afraid. Fear will paralyze you. Fear of the present evil world will keep you doing anything from the cause for the cause of Christ. And that's exactly what the devil wants. If he can paralyze you with fear, you're no problem to him, and he can move on to someone else. Notice what else they say. Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Now you remember just a few chapters before, what does it say they were crying about or crying out about? They're taskmasters. They, they were crying out and had the boo-hoos. And they were upset all because they remained in slavery. And now they're out of slavery and they're crying again. You know what that shows me? Mankind in the flesh will never, ever, ever be satisfied. And the older I get, the more I realize that we are not a satisfied people. If we have something red, we wished it was white. That, 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 that's man's nature. And, and the very same thing here, and so they, they throw the whole responsibility back in Moses' lap. Now this is the reality of it. If they didn't want to come, why did they leave? Right? No. Stay. Uh, uh, don't be a hindrance to us. So they were just passing the buck. Verse 13. Uh, excuse me, verse 12. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Now I think it's a very uh, interesting text. Their desire was to serve the world. What's your desire? What, what's, your, what's your thrust in life? To serve the world or serve the Lord? Because it will define you, it will define you of who you really are. Right. It will, it, 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 however that is, that is how you will present. And when they said this, I think they sincerely mean it. How, how many people do you really be, were, believe were saved out of this group? I think two out of a four and a half million block of people, and that was Caleb and Joshua. They're the only ones that made it to the promised land. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so you're not going to get saved, saved behavior out of lost people. It's just not going to happen. And, and so they began to rebuke Moses. The rest of verse 12. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should die in the wilderness. Now, is that true or not? Do you want to die a free man or do you want to die a slave? Now, so the only thing that we could come to, they love this life more than they love God. I think there's a lot of people today, don't you? 
They love this life. They love the here and now. And they love uh, what they're running after more than they love God. You know, you'll, you'll be defined by what you love. You'll be defined about who, by who you love. Either you'll follow them, either you'll be with them, or you won't. That, 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 that's natural. And so when these people were making these statements, and a lot of people said they did it out of fear. No, no, they did it out of nature. That's who they were. That's genuinely who they were. They were, they, what defined their rebellion is the rebellion that was in their heart. And we see that time and time again over the years. You know, they do the very same thing till Moses struck the rock and water came out. This was their nature. Verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. What are you afraid of? We'd be lying if we said that we weren't afraid of something. What? what would we not? Remember, <laughs> the Lord said, Fear. The Lord in his own ministry said, Fear not. And then he said, Peace be still. But I want you to see, he said, Fear not first. In other words, don't fear during the storm. Don't fear in the here and now. And later on, I will bring peace. You know what? The storm is good for you. In a storm, you can't depend on nobody else, can you? The wind maker is the only one you can depend on. And, and, and so we find that the Lord Jesus huh, huh, suffered the same type of stuff. And so Moses asked them almost an impossible request. Don't be afraid. Now you think about the greatest military force known to man closing in on you. A mountain on each side and water in front of you. Literally nowhere to go. And he's saying, don't you be afraid. Don't you be afraid. Don't, don't worry about what's going to happen. You know, in this flesh, he was asking of them an impossibility. Every one of us face fears every day. When can we quit being scared? When can we quit being fearful when we trust the Lord. Trust Him in the impossible situation. Now that will, that will come in minute exercise down through the years. One after another. You trust Him with this. You trust Him, uh, you trust him for your next meal. You trust Him for the light bill. You tr and, and all He brings us along so when he asks the impossible, we really do trust him. Now, when I say that, it doesn't mean you're going to get what you want. Uh, when I had my brain surgery, they told me this. They said, we cannot guarantee it's not cancer. And they said, if it is, the surgery will make it worse. They couldn't guarantee it getting better. So that's where faith begins, is it not? I was depending on the Lord. Uh, he, he was going to do something grand and marvelous, but I, I would not have had that experience had I not faced it. You see what I'm saying? The, these situations in our life are no accident. They're, they're, they're not something that just uh, happens uh, by, by, by chance. They're authored by the Almighty. And so he asked of them, fear ye not. And then another difficult one for mankind, stand still. Remember Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus? Martha was a go-getter, wasn't she? She wanted to do and do and do. And we find Mary just sitting at the feet of Jesus. I'm a kind of a, a, I'm more of a Martha than I am a Mary. Shame on me, but at least I'm honest, right? I like to do and do and do. But what if Jesus said to you, you just be still. I'm going to do the rest. That's a difficult thing, isn't it? Yeah. When you see the threat behind you, 
You see walls closed in on both sides of you, and you see no escape right ever. And he's saying, you be still. I'm going to do it. And that's a very difficult and a very, a very hard thing uh, <laughs> to do in this humanity. And so we have to make this a spiritual, a spiritual issue when we're waiting on the Lord. Notice the blessing in the rest of verse 13. Which he will shew to you today, for the Egyptians who ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Now, now uh, I want you to notice this. They saw some Egyptians later, but they didn't see those Egyptians. Now, you know why they saw other Egyptians later? It's because they did not trust God. But they did not ever see that bunch again. They were drowned in the Red Sea. Did that mean the Egyptians wasn't ever coming back? No, no. See, there'll be return attacks. That's how Satan works. That's the things he does. When you think you finally got over the hump, he'll return on you again. And sometimes he has more than he left with the first time. He doesn't want you to serve the Lord. He, he has no interest in your spiritual well-being. And, and, and so we see that Moses almost asked an impossibility of them. Verse 14, The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Now, if you underline in your Bible, you underline peace. Because peace is is one of the most difficult things you will ever gain. Peace in every circumstance. When he says, peace, be still, do it. You, you know, uh, it's hard to be still when the house is on fire. Right? It really is. But he says, I'm going to do all that, and I want you to peacefully stand still. That, that, that is an unbelievable request. But what else were they going to do? Well, what else could they possibly do with the threat that was formed? The greatest military force on the face of the earth were, was just right behind them. And the Lord's solution was you be still. You got somebody you prayed for years about being saved and you're still praying today? Stand still. Peace. Very difficult thing. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me? Now, I'm assuming, as usual, when Moses got into a mess, he flops on the, on the ground and begins to cry out to God. You remember, remember him and Aaron did the same thing, and God said, Get up. Uh, he says, their sin camp. That's when Oaken had uh, had the uh, the statues and stuff hidden his stuff. He said, "Get up." You know what we need to do as the Lord's people sometimes is just get up and do what God says. God had already said, "Hey, I'm going to give you victory today." And so when they when he got the hem hauls from the big group and he fell down on the ground, he said, get up. It's time to do something. It, 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 it's not time to stop. It's time to move forward. You, you know what it is in 2022 for God's people? It's time for us to move forward. Yeah. It is not time for us to give up. It is not, to, uh, time, it is not time to hang the harness on, on the barn door. It's time to move forward. And huh, God said Mo, to Moses, get up. Uh, huh, you got stuff to do. You have things still to perform. Now notice he gives him some instruction. And Moses said, and the Lord said unto Moses, <coughs> Wherefore Christ thou unto me, uh, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Now that seems pretty simple, except you've got to see it in front of you. Anybody ever seen an ocean or a sea? The only difference is the oceans never stop and the sea has got land around it. Uh, uh, the ocean is an unbelievable sight. You want to walk across it? 
closest thing we got around here, uh, the biggest one is the uh, <laughs> the Tennessee River down here, uh, Kentucky Lake. I don't know why they got to name it, but anyway, uh, the Tennessee River, Kentucky Lake. You wanna you wanna prance across it? Does he ask of that today? I think he could, don't you? Sure. Are we going to do it? See, we got too many hang-ups. Well, that was in the Bible time. Well, the Lord says, I am, I am the Lord. I change not. So, is his request of us going to change just because we lived in such a corrupt day? I, I don't think they will. Uh, I don't think he, he is going to cut us any slack just because we live in a wicked and vile day. And so he spoke to the children. He said, speaking to the children, <laughs> that they go forward. I want you to move in one direction, and that's toward the Red Sea. But lift up thy rod and stretch forth thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now he says it's a very simple plan. I want you to raise the rod and I want to you to raise your hand. How many people, how many Baptists do you see raising your hand, their hands today? You know what the Bible says? Man, you listen to me. I would that the men everywhere lift holy hands. You do that in Sodom Grace Church, they think you know what can it cost you? Right? And, and, and so we see <laughs> what do you think Moses thought about those instructions? Now probably Moses believed them. But if you had the greatest military force behind you and there was no way out and that was your leader's plan <laughs> what are you going to do? That puts it in a different situation, doesn't it? Yeah. That, you know, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the best measure of your faith that I can give you is that we, huh, he's going to put us in those situations and what is your faith going to be? Are you going to trust God's plan? And notice it says, and the children of Israel will go on dry ground. Now, Y'all remember the 60s movies, or some of you do, uh, uh, of, the Red, of the Red Sea Crossing. Uh, was it Ben-Hur? I can't remember who played Moses in that movie. And it, they were walking in shallow water. Oh, no, no. That's the best Hollywood could come up with, is question the authority of God. They kicked up dust going on to the other side. There, was, there wasn't even a sprinkle of water left. Do you believe the Bible? I, be I believe it was nothing for them to do. Now, you know, also in that foolish movie, maybe the, the little water thing was maybe as wide as this lot. How are you going to get four and a half million people through a little place like that? Huh? I believe it was miles wide and they went right across on dry land. All four and a half million with their cattle. Remember, they had requested to take the cattle with them. And, and, and you remember, I love this, because it's contrary to women's nature. They went over to uh, they went over to their Egyptian friends and said, man, that's a pretty gold pot you got. You want that pot here? <laughs> and it's what they would build the temple right. with later. Sure. And uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was what they all had. They had an unbelievable amount of stuff, plus the stock, plus the people. They're going to need a big, wide place to cross. And God granted it. Is there anything too hard for God? Yeah. And, and so we see that uh, Moses was obedient, and the plan was simple. Now he's going to give them the more difficult part. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Now, I want, I want you to see that 
that yeah, we're going to deliver you. The Almighty says we're going to we're going to deliver you. This is the way that you do it to be delivered. But you're going to have the enemy right behind you. You know what? Those of us that are redeemed, we are just like the nation of Israel. We are delivered, but the enemy is right behind us. Now he can't take you down as false religions teach today. <laughs> But he can destroy your testimony. Right. And he can make you wish you were down. Mm -hmm. He's a deceiver. Mm -hmm. You know what? He's not going to use on most people with any spirituality at all, beer and pot to bring you down. He's going to bring stuff that looks good. <laughs> Big thing right now, and I don't want to <laughs> get into that too deep, is this Reformed Baptist. Maybe it looks good, don't it? But the thing with the Reformed Baptist, you know what it is? You have to acknowledge the church went out of existence to be called Reformed, do you not? They're going hook, line, and singer church. That's what they're going. And it looks so good, the devil's at their back and they don't even know it. And, and, and so we see as the Lord's people that we need to continue moving forward with the enemy at our back. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, verse 18, and I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went from the before the camp of the Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went before them, and their, before their face, and stood behind them. Now notice they had two protectors. First of all, you think of the power of the Almighty. How many angels had their back? One. Four and a half million people with the greatest army on earth at that time running <laughs> down on them. And one angel can protect them. Is that not amazing? Is that not is that not an unbelievable thought? And then we get stressed out about stuff. We, 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 want, we begin to wring our hands when the nickels and dimes aren't going for enough. And one angel withstood the entire Egyptian army. We, he has enough. Right. He is sufficient. Amen. Uh, and so we see then, as the Lord's people, that we need to remember that when things get stressful so huh, we don't do stupid things. And uh, verse 19. I also want you to see that the pillar of the cloud went behind them as well. Right. You can't see through the pillar of the cloud. He blinded Egypt. They could not even see where their enemy was. A temporary hand of protection. Verse 19. And the angel of God went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went before them, and their face and their face and stood behind them. And it came to pass that the camp of the Egyptians and, and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light to, by night to these. So, so did you get that? Uh, the, the, the protecting hand of the angel and the cloud threw darkness on the enemy, but it was a great and wonderful light to God's people. Wow. That's looking at that, that that's two different ways to see it, is it not? And and that blessed old book in your life, you know what they 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 see that as heresy, they see it as and as being a bigot, they see it as you being mean, and we see it of the glorious light of the Almighty God of heaven. See, it's always been that way, has it not? But in other words, the presence of God means nothing to the boss. It means nothing to the boss. I had a woman talk to me the other day, well, why does she act that way? And I said, well, she's lost. <laughs> I said, don't anticipate redeemed behavior from, from the lost. You're not going to get it. 
because they're lovers of darkness. That, that's the shed upon them. And so we see the Lord provides at nighttime and in, a, in, a, in an incredible, marvelous way. Verse 21, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind and all, uh, all the night, and made the sea, dry, the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Now, uh, I want you to just take note very quickly, it took all night. We like that, do we not? You know what? Sometimes it's going to take all night. Sometimes it may take 50 years. Just keep praying. Just be patient. Hardest thing you'll ever do is be patient as this text instructs us to do. Verse 22, And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left, and the Egyptians pursued. Now, I want you to see, and you think about this, and I always think about how marvelous it might have, must have been, and they were moving forward. You know, in Ben Hur's movie, they're running like, uh, uh, like scalded dogs, aren't they? The Bible doesn't say that. It said they were walking. They moved forward. Just like they were supposed to be. Continue forward in the service of the Lord and don't look back. But wouldn't it have been interesting to look over to the sea beside you and see all the whales and the fish right there beside you? And you're just walking forward. Walking forward. You know, uh, the best thing you can do as a Christian example is to keep walking forward. Don't let this world bring you down. That, that, that's what Satan wants. You keep just moving, moving forward. And so they go, but I want you to see the enemy is right behind them. The enemy is coming at their heels. And the Egyptians pursued, verse 23, and went in after them in the midst of the sea, even all the Pharaoh's, uh, even all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels. Now, I want you to see, and, and the water does close and drown them every one. <clears throat> but God took care of the chariots first. You ever wonder why he did that? So they couldn't run the other way. You know, I'll tell you an interesting thing, and, and I don't have to have, as Brother Jared said, uh, creed, I don't have to have science to show me that that book is real. But the Red Sea became very dry several years ago. And at the floor of the Red Sea, they found chariot wheels. <laughs> you can't move a chariot without its wheels, can you? So he paralyzed them. And then you know the rest. He drowns every one of them. Watch the people make it to the other side, and they rejoice in the Lord as the well they should. You know what? Being your family and being your pastor, Really, I have no idea what you're going through today. And uh, I understand more and more that I don't, think under, I don't understand the needs of these young people. Things are different. And, and I'm sure every generation sees that, but here recently I've, I've really began to see it. And I, I have no idea what you're up against. But I know my God does. Yeah. I know, I know that Pharaoh, the devil, Satan, is chasing you in one way or the other. But I know my God's able. Yeah. He can close the Red Sea. Amen. Amen. To snap. He don't even have to snap his fingers. We need to trust him more, do we not? Yeah. We're, we're, we're in a bad spot, church, I realize that. But we need to trust him more. Right. When you're when the enemy's right behind you, keep going. They had they had no choice. And you know what? God's people always do that. Remember, I mentioned this, and the Lord said, Y'all go over to the other side of the sea, I'm gonna dismiss the crowd. 
and I'll meet you over there. But in the fourth watch of the night, just before dawn, and you know what it says that Peter and the others were still doing? They were still rolling. <laughs> I said, that's a good church. <clears throat> we need to do that. 